Okay, with that, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Natalyn Delap. I am the executive director of the Humboldt County Growers Alliance. And it is our honor to present Omar Figueroa and Lauren Mendelson to lead a webinar on building an intellectual property portfolio. This webinar is recorded, and so um, be aware. We're asking folks to hold your questions to the end of the presentation or uh, ask them in the chat feature, and we will get to everybody throughout the, the webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. Omar, Lauren. Awesome, thank you so much for having us. Um, this is uh, the second one of these monthly webinars that we've done hosted by HCGA, and we're very grateful and we're looking forward to um, a lot more interesting programming. So definitely stay tuned um, for our next one next month. And uh, today's topic is about building an IP portfolio uh, with a focus on how cannabis companies can, can build up and protect their IP. And um, Omar is going to lead uh, this for the most part. I will be chiming in and, and giving some comments uh, throughout the presentation. If you have questions throughout the presentation, please add them. You can write them in the chat box. I think there might be a way to, to write your questions down, and then we will get to them at the end of the presentation. We're going to save a few minutes for Q&A. Um, so just you can type those questions, and uh, we'll answer them when we get there. Um, so uh, let's see. First, I'll, I'll handle some of these intro slides and then I'll let Omar do the rest of the presentation. So quick disclaimer, this is not legal advice. We are attorneys, but this is not legal advice. The information that you hear today is just for educational and informational purposes. Uh, don't rely on anything that you hear from us. We are not your attorneys just because you listen to this presentation. Um, and uh, you know, make sure that you do speak with an attorney about your specific situation if you do have questions. Um, that's basically what that says in a nutshell. You can go to the next slide. Um, so this is a little bit about Omar. Omar, talk about yourself for a quick minute. Oh, yes. I'm a director of the National Cannabis Industry Association, the uh, Cannabis Travel Association International, and the Vast Sebastopol Center for the Arts. I'm also a chapter leader of the Sonoma County ACLU chapter, uh, founding lifetime member and former director of the International Cannabis Bar Association, lifetime member of the Normal Legal Committee, and recognized with a rare Distinguished Counsel's Award by Normal. Uh, I've authored numerous legal reference books, including California Cannabis Laws and Regulations and New York Cannabis Laws and Regulations. Um, I'm also a member of the prestigious Gangier Council, and I collaborated with cannabis luminaries in developing a curriculum for training cannabis sommeliers, as well as a systematic assessment protocol for judging fine cannabis. And Lauren? Yes, I am Lauren Mendelson, and I'm a senior associate attorney at Omar's office, um, an activist, and um, I've also been named a Northern California Rising Star by Super Lawyers for the past couple of years. Um, a little bit of what I do, um, regulatory compliance, permitting and licensing, IP, business transactions, um, advocacy and lobbying work, um, among some other things. I was the uh, chair of the board of directors of Students for Sensible Drug Policy um, a few years back, which is an international nonprofit ending the war on drugs. And then currently, I'm on the board of directors for the International Cannabis Bar Association and the Sonoma County Growers Alliance. I was also recently appointed to um, Americans for Safe Access is California Advisory Council. It's not on there yet. Um, and I went to school, a law school at UC Irvine and got my undergrad at University of Maryland. Go Terps. So next, quick outline of what we're talking about today. I'll give you an overview of intellectual property, what it is and the different forms. And then we'll go into the specific types. We've got copyrights, trademarks, also service marks and uh, certification marks and trade secrets, patents, and then we're going to talk about appellations of origin, how they relate to IP and branding, as well as city of origin, county of origin, and city and county of origin designations, the California's OCAL program, and um, also IP holding companies. We'll talk about that and IP licensing deals. And then at the end, we'll have some time for Q&A. All right. I guess I'll start. 
Um, <clears throat> so according to the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, intellectual property refers to creations of the mind, such as inventions like the uh, electronic vape pen down below, literary and artistic works like Harry Potter or even Basquiat's Untitled, which is worth more than $100 million, uh, the signs such as that Louboutin uh, shoes that you see on the lower right side, and symbols, names, and images used in commerce like the Nike logo we see at the bottom right. Um, avoid infringing on someone else's IP if you want to avoid litigation, and in order to avoid infringing, you have to conduct basically uh, a IP clearance and make sure that when you're utilizing intellectual property that you're not conflicting. Now we'll talk about copyrights. So Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution gives Congress the power to enact laws to, quote, promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. According to the US Copyright Office, copyright is a type of intellectual property that protects original works of authorship as soon as the author fixes that work in a tangible form of expression. According to WIPO, copyright or author's rights is a legal term used to describe the rights that creators have over their literary and artistic works. And then Lauren, can you talk about use of the copyright symbol? Sure, so the C symbol that you see there uh, is it designates the copyright symbol. Uh, you may use that if it's a registered copyright, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. If you note at the top of our presentation, uh, says copyright 2022, law offices of Omar Figueroa, all rights reserved for educational purposes only. We are using the symbol to indicate to others that this is our original content and we are treating it like a copyright. So it's a little bit different. We're going to talk about symbols when we get to trademarks as well. And there's some differences, um, differences there. So an example of cannabis copyrights is like the series of books that I put together. And although the laws and the regulations themselves cannot be copyrighted, a carefully curated compendium of the laws and regulations can be copyrighted. The creative selection and arrangement of the materials is copyrightable as a compilation. And then for copyright infringement, one cannot sue if the material is not registered with the US Copyright Office. So that's a big incentive to register with the US Copyright Office is the inability to sue if one has not registered the work. Which is different than it is with trademarks, as we'll see. All right. So at the state level, trademarks and service marks indicating the source of the goods or services in lawful commerce can be registered, usually with the Secretary of State. For example, the California Secretary of State registers cannabis trademarks as long as the marks are used in lawful commerce in California. California law does not allow for intent to use registrations or certification mark registrations. And Lauren, can, can you tell us what an intent to use is kind of briefly? Sure. So at the federal level, as we'll get into in a moment, you can, when you apply for or to register a trademark, there's different bases that, bases that you can apply under. Um, one of them is called in use, which means you are currently using that mark in legal commerce. Or there's intent to use, which means you have an intent to legally use it in interstate commerce or if we're talking California, uh, interstate commerce in the future. You cannot get your mark fully registered at the federal level until it is actually in use. So if you file an intent to use application, um, you do ultimately need to show that you are using it before they'll grant you the full registration certificate. But that option is not even available in California. The, I plan to do it in the future. You can't file and get your trademark registered at the state level until it's actually in legal use in commerce. And then what's the certification mark? And, and can you do that in California? Yeah, so that's not available in California. We'll talk a little bit about this on the, the following slide. But certification marks are, are a unique thing. They can be registered only at the federal level. 
Um, they don't have to be registered, but it's better to, to get that protection. And what a certification mark is, is it is a mark um, that is owned by essentially a third party certifying body. And if other parties meet the standards set forth by the certifying body, then those other parties can use the certifier's mark. The certifier cannot use that mark as to indicate, you know, their goods. They can't use it as a trademark. It's supposed to be for other parties who meet their standards to put on their mark. Um, and we'll get into on the next slide one of those that we've, we've done with the client. Now, at the federal level, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, known as USPTO, does not register trademarks for cannabis because it's a Schedule One controlled substance at this time. But it does register trademarks for hemp, defined as, quote, the plant cannabis TBL with a delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol THC concentration of not more than 0.3% on a dry weight basis, end quote. This is because a mark must be legally used in interstate commerce in order to be eligible for registration. And before you get to the next slide, let me add something on that last point. Um, when we're talking about um, cannabis related and hemp related trademarks at the federal level, as Omar just said, you can't get it for cannabis itself, the federal trademark, but it could potentially for a hemp related product or a hemp derived product. That, however, it still needs to be legally used in interstate commerce, which means there's, there's other laws that might apply to that as well. In particular, the US FDA, Food and Drug Administration, has um, said that CBD and THC are, cannot be put in food or drinks or sold as a dietary supplement or as a drug unless it has FDA approval. So if you are applying to register a hemp-derived CBD food-based product, that's not going to work right now because the FDA doesn't allow it to be in food. You would have to do it for something that is allowed. Now, smokable hemp is legal. That you could get through at the federal level, um, but not if you were calling it a dietary supplement. So you still need to be aware of the other laws and regulations that, uh, that would apply and make sure it's a legal use. Okay, next slide. And then what about the uh, symbols for oh, yes. trademarks and service marks? Okay, so yes, quick talk on this. So, and kind of going back to that very first point, um, trademarks and service marks. So quick note on what a trademark is versus a service mark. A trademark um, is for goods. A service mark is for services. So if you are a distribution company, um, you're uh, called Distributor Co., you wouldn't use a TM, you'd use an SM because you provide a service, not a good. And so keep that in mind. Some of you guys are service providers, some of you are goods providers, some are both. So depending on whether you're using that mark in conjunction with goods or services, it'll either be a TM or an SM, unless it's federally registered, in which case you can use the R with a circle around it. Okay. All right, here's an example of a federally registered mark, Swami Select, and it's for hemp. This is actually still an application. Oh no, this is the 2018. This is this one is live. This this one is. It's an application at this point still. Okay. Um, it's a live application. We're in the process of submitting the statement of use so that can get finalized. So this is still in progress. They've gotten to the very mm -hmm. final stages. Um, and so you got uh, a notice of allowance. It, correct. Can you explain what yeah. that is. So it's listed in the Fed. It's listed in. Um, you know, it's been published in the Trademark Gazette, which uh, is what happens once the USPTO gets through reviewing it and says, okay, this doesn't look like it's going to infringe. This looks like it is good to go. We've addressed any potential issues regarding um, illegality or, or anything like that. We've really worked and crafted this description of goods and services so it complies with federal law. Other parties have 30 days uh, to to oppose it if they think that it infringes on their mark or if it shouldn't be registered that that 30 day period has elapsed and so at this point we are just um, waiting until the client is able to provide an actual specimen and have it be used in, in legal interstate commerce and then the registration certificate will issue excellent and so it has obtained notice of allowance so now you know um, the next step is to show that it's an actual interstate commerce but you, nobody else can start using this mark or apply for it, correct? Mm -hmm. And then what about this certification mark on the right? Can you tell us right. about that? 
Sure. So when you actually get your mark registered at the USPTO, you get what the thing on the right is. That's a registration certificate. And this shows how, um, you know, the different number and what it is. You can see this one is for a certification mark. And so this one, um, we represented um, Original Equity Group, and we helped them register this uh, certification mark for um, essentially equity businesses and producers, uh, equity businesses that produce different types of goods. And so you can see here, Omar just kind of blew up the uh, description of the mark and what it, it certifies. And so it says this certification mark as used or intended to be used by persons authorized by the certifier, which would be OEG in this case, certifies or is intended to certify that the goods provided have been produced by a business that meets the standards set by a US state, county or city social equity program that seeks to address social inequalities and policy concerns related to gender and sexuality, race, age, mental or physical disability, class, ethnicity, language, education, civil rights, socioeconomic status or religion by requiring that a business's ownership structure, operations, employment practices, or charitable contributions demonstrate a commitment to justice and inequality, and equality, pardon me. Um, so you'll see that um, this is a bit of a mouthful and you might wonder why this was so um, wordy and why we came to this um, description of the certification mark. And, and really what we were trying to encompass um, was not really kind of any business that meets these standards doesn't necessarily have to be for cannabis, but what they did not make us do is exclude cannabis. Um, and I think that is very um, important because they're at first when we first submitted this, the USPTO was saying, well, we think that this has to do with cannabis, therefore we're not going to approve it. And we had to challenge that and say, look, there's nothing in this that is inherently about cannabis. Furthermore, there's nothing illegal about simply saying that a business um, meet certain standards. The, the, there's no actual cannabis that was ever be changing hands when the certifier simply looks at the business structure of a business to say, yes, they do or they don't meet this criteria. Um, so we work with the USPTO in getting that description down um, and, and kind of by tying it to equity programs that have been adopted by governments, we felt like that was kind of a little bit of a safer way to go as well. Um, but, and it worked out. So that's been registered. And I, I know that... Um, there, this mark can currently be found on, on various cannabis and other goods in California. So that's pretty exciting. Yes, Lauren. And also it's funny how uh, the, I guess the, the description ended up being, you know, uh, plants, seeds, flowers, and herbs, none of the foregoing being wheat, maize, Bermuda grass, and lettuce. So it's excluding all those, but it's not excluding cannabis. How, how did that happen? Well, there, the USPTO identified some mark that looked somewhat similar to this for maize, Bermuda grass, wheatgrass, with those other things, those other types of plants. Um, and so in order to avoid infringement, we had to carve those out. But again, they didn't make us carve out cannabis, which is great. Excellent. All right, so let's go uh, to discuss some issues involving cannabis trademarks. Uh, yeah. wh what do we have in front of us? What's what's what does this look like? Yeah, those are some clearly infringing products. So um, they clearly look like um, candy that's commercially available, Reese's cups and Sour Patch Kids. So these were some cannabis companies that were trying to um, take advantage of the you know, people recognizing these other brands, but that's a big no-no because you are just asking for um, a cease and desist letter followed by a lawsuit if you don't stop. And um, I don't know what the exact outcome, these were new ones I hadn't seen before. I just went online this morning. There's a lot of kind of more common um, ones that we've heard of, but these are the first time I saw these two. Um, and um, don't do that, <laughs> don't do that. Um, let's see, this next one, um, this is pretty interesting. So this happens to do with the Kiva um, trademark case that some of you may have heard about. So there's a cannabis company in California, Kiva Confections. A lot of you have probably heard of them. There's also an unrelated health food company based in some other state with the same name. And this lawsuit was over who has the right to the name Kiva. And um, there was a lot of back and forth. The case went on for a while. Um, but ultimately, what the cannabis company in California was, was trying to argue is that, look, we've been using the mark 
for um, a longer time than the other company has. So therefore, and it's been legal in California, we've been following California laws, so we should have the, the um, superior rights to the name. The other company had it registered at the federal level, but they stopped. They didn't start using it until afterwards. Well, this was a federal case, and the judge decided um, that the, the common law rights of the California Cannabis Company, even though they existed longer, could not uh, supersede the federal trademark rights of the other company. And so this is relevant for cannabis companies. If you don't have a federally registered trademark, you can't just rely on the fact that you've used your mark in California for five, 10 years if another company is able to get a similar mark registered at the federal level and tries to sue you. Unfortunately, the way, at least the way this case has come out so far, it seems as though they would have a superior right to that. Um, so that's an interesting case. Um, this other one that just popped up, um, this is a recent case where there was an application, an intent to use application for tea. And one of the types of tea, like herbal teas, was going to include CBD. And it was intent to use. And as if you recall, a few slides ago, I said that the FDA is not okay with CBD going in food or drinks, tea is a drink. And so um, the USPTO was not going to register this mark because they said it wouldn't comply with the FDA's rules. It wouldn't be used in interstate commerce. The um, International Cannabis Bar Association just the other day submitted an amicus brief um, asking that this be registered and that they reconsider this because arguing that cannabis businesses and cannabis applications are held to a, a different standard than other types of applications. For example, when pharmaceutical companies go to register the trademark of a new drug they're in development with, they're able to get that registered even though the drug itself has not yet been approved by the FDA. So that would seem to you know, suggest that these CBD drinks could be approved under an intent to use theory. Um, so that's really interesting. Again, that amicus brief was just filed, you can see February 25th, so I guess about a week or so ago. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how that case turns out. You wanna take this one, Lauren? Sure. Trade secrets. So trade secrets are defined in California law as information, including a formula, pattern, compilation, program, device, method, technique, or process that, one, derives economic, independent economic value, actual or potential, from not being generally known to the public or to other persons who can obtain economic value from its disclosure of use, and two, is the subject of efforts that are reasonable under the circumstances to maintain its secrecy. And you can see that's where um, that is from, that citation. What are some common trade secrets? Uh, client lists, secret formulas, secret recipes, um, different business practices. Um, some other famous trade secrets include the Google search algorithm, the recipe for Coca-Cola. Um, they're not registered because that would destroy the secret. They're valuable because they're secret. And you can disclose them to certain people, like employees or things like that, but it has to be under a very clear agreement that says what they can and cannot do with that information, who, if anyone else, they're allowed to disclose it to, what the penalties are if they do disclose it in an unauthorized way. Um, so that's how you can protect those. Um, and they're also protected under federal law under the Defend Trade Secrets Act of 2016. Um, and the definition of a trade secret in this act protects all types of proprietary info as long as reasonable measures are taken to keep this information secret and the information derives independent economic value from not being generally known. Um, and you can see here is there is a similar type of definition. This is now the federal definition. You can just kind of compare how it looks versus the California one. I'm not gonna necessarily go through and read all that, but it's similar to the definition in California law. Um, now it is critical that you implement a comprehensive trade secret protection program with things like NDAs, like I was just talking about and, and so forth. All right, patents. So um, according to the US Patent and Trademark Office, a patent for an invention is a grant of a property right to the inventor issued by the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Generally, the term of a new patent is 20 years from the application filing date. The right conferred by the grant of the patent is, in the language of the statute and of the patent grant itself, 
quote, the right to exclude others from making, using, offering for sale or selling the invention in the United States or importing the invention into the United States. What is granted is not the right to make, use, offer for sale, sell or import, but rather the right to exclude others from doing so. Uh, there's three types of patents. First, we have utility patents, which may be granted to anyone who invents or discovers any new or use and useful process, machine, article of manufacture, or composition of matter, or any new and useful improvement thereof. And on the right, we see the self-operated napkin uh, Rube Goldberg machine. There's also design patents, which may be granted to anyone who invents a new original and ornamental design for an article of manufacture. And on the right, we see the uh, classic design for the hourglass Coca-Cola bottle. And there's also plant patents that may be granted to anyone who invents or discovers and asexually reproduces any distinct and new variety of plant. And on the right, we see the claim for the Haas avocado. And these were all like registered patents. Now for plant patents, which are for asexually reproduced plants, there's a limited scope of protection. The protection is limited to asexual reproduction. So the uh, patented material cannot be asexually reproduced or cloned without permission. Um, a plant patent provides no protection against unauthorized sexual reproduction via pollination. And down below, we see a uh, granted US patent given to Steve Covey for his Ecuadorian sativa. And here is the description of the Ecuadorian sativa. The new strain has energizing and motivating psychoactive effects as opposed to the lethargy normally associated with the subspecies indica and shows hypotensive effects. Morphologically, the plants have a few branch hairs on the stem that are not characteristic of the species, but are ordinary in most other respects. And you, know, you have to show for a plant patent that this is something that's new and unique. It can't just be something that's out in the public domain. And if I can just add real quick, so you all watching now might notice that hey, this is a patent for cannabis, but we were just talking about how trademarks, you couldn't get one for cannabis at the federal level. And that's because the patent law at the federal level does not have a requirement that the, um, the object being patented be legally used in commerce the way that the trademark law does. Um, copyrights do not have that same requirement either. That's how Omar was able to copyright his books about cannabis laws. Um, so it's really just trademarks that have that legal use in commerce requirement. That's a really good point. Somebody can patent nuclear weapons and yet they're not in lawful commerce because they're forbidden by arms control treaties. All right, now we have utility patents um, and they offer the greatest degree of protection uh, uh, when it comes to cannabis plants and the US Patent and Trademark Office has issued utility patents for actual cannabis plants. And here we have like the first one uh, that was issued and look at the sweeping claims. It says in some embodiments, the present invention provides specialty cannabis plants having a THC content that is more than 2%, but less than 90% and a non-THC cannabinoid content based on the uh, dry weight that is more than 1.5%. And then it shows like all of the possibilities um, which is an extremely broad claim. And I think was only, you know, this patent application uh, has been granted. Uh, it was not challenged at the time that it was proposed. I don't know if it would survive any uh, challenge in court on the basis that uh, this clearly encompasses uh, prior art. You know, cannabis in the public domain, I know that there's cannabis out there before this patent was granted. Uh, that had some of these um, percentages. And, uh, you know, this patent was granted in 2015. And, you know, there's such, it's such a broad patent that um, who knows if it will stand. But, you know, this is the kind of stuff that USPTO is granting patent, patents to. What are your thoughts, Lauren? 
I think it is very broad. I think that really the issue was there was not, because cannabis is still legal at the federal level and is only recently being legalized um, at the state levels, there is not a, a an easy database of the prior art that people at the USPTO can go to, to look and see, did this thing exist or not? Because a lot of folks weren't uploading information about their cannabis strains to the internet in fear of getting arrested. And so the information's out there, but it's not in the places that USPTO is used to looking for it. Um, and so that's, I know there have been some efforts to create prior art databases in cannabis and more recently in the psychedelic space, because there's a huge patent rush happening in psychedelics right now. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, this is definitely there. There's not every patent is issued. Um, that's, that is issued should, should be issued. But again, if no one opposes it and if they don't find it, then they're not going to know. Now let's switch over to Appalachians of Origin. Can you take this one, Lauren? Sure. So Appalachians of Origin now in California requires um, CDFA to establish a process whereby licensed cultivators can establish Appalachians of Origin, including standards, practices, and cultivars applicable to cannabis produced in a ge certain geographical area. Um, and these are terroir based, these Appalachians. An Appalachian of Origin shall not be approved unless it requires the practice of planting in the ground in the canopy area and excludes the practice of using structures, including a greenhouse, hoop house, glass house, conservatory, hothouse, and any similar structure and any artificial light in the canopy area. Um, so needs to be fully outdoor, no artificial light. Um, and they're not the Appalachians program. They've adopted their final regulations, um, but they haven't started taking in the applications and yet they anticipate that'll happen later this year. First, they have to um, get the people who are going to be like the, um, the certifiers, the folks that are gonna review the applications for the Appalachians, um, they have to select those folks first. Um, and so let's see administrative structure. There's gonna be a virtual stakeholder meeting sometime soon. I haven't heard anything further about that. Um, you can see on the right um, is the mark that a particular group of cultivators has developed for the appellation that they are seeking to um, establish. And so that is, uh, we are working with them on that. Um, so. Let's, and this is related again to um, to you know, your trademarks and your branding. That's why this is part of your um, IP and as well as your trade dress. You can't say it's your trademark, but it is something that would you would be able to um, to put on your products and and from a branding perspective could could help. Um, so the petition to establish an appellation of origin, um, this goes through some of the different requirements for those petitions. Um, you need a description and uh, of name and history of the proposed appellation of origin including an explanation of how that name has been used in the geographical area, um, maps and a narrative description of the boundary of the proposed appellation, a narrative description of the distinct geographical features that affect cannabis production there. You have to identify at least one specific standard practice or cultivar requirement that acts to preserve the causal links between one or more distinctive geographical features and the cannabis, including a description of the mechanism by which the requirement preserves or maintains the causal link and a clear distinction between cultivation methods which are allowed and prohibited under each requirement. So there's a lot that you need to get together for there. And the purpose of all of that again is, is to, um, to, to draw the connection between why is this geographical area so special? Why does this deserve to be its own appellation? What does it do to the cannabis that makes it special? What do people do to their cannabis and how do they grow it in this area that makes it special? And you gotta again, tie all of those back to the geographical um, area. Okay, uh, the next other type of intellectual property, and this is, I guess, a type of, geographical indication are the city of origin, county of origin, and city and county of origin designations. And in California, you know, in case you're wondering like what city and county, what's that about? Uh, in California, we have 58 counties and 482 cities and one city and county, and that's San Francisco. 
Not so to be confused with the other cities and counties that have the same name, but are different um, governmental bodies, like the county of LA and the city of LA are different things, but the city and county of San Francisco are, are one. Are coextensive, yeah. Like the you know county of Sacramento and the city of Sacramento, very different animals. Uh, California law requires the Department of Food and Agriculture to establish a process by which a licensed cultivator may designate a county, city, or city and county of origin for cannabis. To be eligible for the designation, 100% of the cannabis shall be produced within the designated county, city, or city and county as defined by finite political boundaries. And on the right, we see some of these, you know, which I think would be valuable in terms of driving sales, like the county of Humboldt, that's like a premium uh, you know, geographical indicator. The city of weed has really been trying to play off its name and off the cannabis culture, uh, you know, reverberations of its funny name. And then the city and county of San Francisco um, also, you know, is something that could be, I guess, um, I haven't really seen it yet, but I think people could try to capture that city and county. Lauren, what, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I haven't really seen businesses take advantage of this too much. Um, and it's something that, again, as long as 100% of the cannabis was produced within that city, county, or city and county, you, you could use that and it could help with your branding. Um, so I'm, I'm eager to see if more companies take advantage of that. All right, OCAL program. So um, California has this program for comparable to organic designation for cannabis. It's going to be a statewide certification program um, that's going to establish and enforce comparable to organic cannabis standards. And if uh, you do get OCAL certified to meet their standards, you can use that OCAL logo on your products. So the OCAL program is intended to ensure that cannabis products bearing the OCAL seal have been certified to consistent uniform standards comparable to the national organic program. Until cannabis is legal at the federal level, you can't have that USDA organic sticker on it, which is why California created this. So as of right now, um, as of 225-22, here is a list of the OCAL certified operations. Um, and let's see, and these are just the cultivation. Manufacturers are also getting certified by OCAL right now. It's a little bit harder to find that list. I think that's still on the MCSB page potentially, um, but it is manufacturers can also get OCAL certified um, if they meet the standards. Here are the cultivators and there's information about that process um, on the um, OCAL page on CDFA website. Now let's talk about intellectual property holding companies. IP holding companies hold and actively manage intellectual property assets, such as copyrights, trademarks, trade secrets, utility patents, plant patents, uh, appellations of origin, OCAL designations, you know, everything that we've been discussing here, which are things that go into an intellectual property portfolio. Um, in IP talk, it's important to remember that the word assignment means sale and the word license means rental. So the way these IP holding companies work is that IP assets are assigned to the IP holding company. So basically the IP holding company buys IP assets and then it rents those assets to operating companies. These operating companies use the IP assets to run their businesses. And uh, here we have like a hypothetical. So the top secret recipe for the world's most delicious cannabis infused chocolate chip cookies is owned by a fictitious IP holding company named Yum Nom Holdings. Yum Nom Holdings licenses this valuable trade secret to an operating company, which happens to be a licensed cannabis manufacturing facility in California. The operating company, which is an IP licensee uses a top secret recipe and ends up with a best-selling product. In exchange for the IP license, the operating company pays royalties to Yun Nam Holdings. And then imagine licensees in other states and all over the world. Would the royalty payments multiply? Yeah, that's pretty much the business model. It's, mm -hmm. uh, 
And then um, it, click one more time. There's one more thing at the bottom. And then I want to say a little bit about this. So you want to make sure you avoid what's called a naked license, which is when you license your IP to another party and you don't uh, have any oversight over what they do with it. Um, that is problematic because you could actually lose your rights if you are not maintaining a sufficient level of oversight. So if we're talking about, and this could come up in the cannabis space, for example, um, you are doing like a white labeling agreement. If you, as the brand owner, are not making sure that they're using your brand uh, assets properly, um, then you could you could lose your rights. Now, another thing I wanted to note: note in this diagram how it says there's you know tax savings and shielding assets. So the reason that you would traditionally separate out your IP into a different company than your operating company is to protect your different assets uh, for some liability protection. Um, if someone something were to happen at your dispensary, someone injures themselves, you don't necessarily want them to be able to go after your IP as well. So if you have that separated in a different entity, it'll limit um, the people that can reach that in the event something happens to other companies. And there could, in the traditional space, also be some tax savings there. Now, there is a caveat. Um, it has to do with Section 280E of the tax code. So as you guys all know, cannabis companies have to deal with um, Section 280E, which does not allow cannabis companies to take their standard business deductions on their federal income tax returns. Um, so that people think, well, maybe if I separate all my IP into another IP holding company, then nothing that holding company does is going to be subject to 280E. Wrong. If all that company is doing is managing cannabis-related stuff, it also could be subject to 280E. There's a recent um, tax court decision that says this. And so if you are taking, trying to utilize this holding company model and not get double hit with 280E, it's important that the holding company has a diverse portfolio of things that it's holding. So maybe you also hold some non-cannabis related IP. Maybe it also has some, I don't know, honestly, just have some things that aren't cannabis in there. And it's not a surefire way to avoid that, but it's definitely going to um, help your argument and, and you know, alleviate uh, the likelihood with which 280E would also apply to that holding company. Great point. All right, I guess now we reach the point of questions and answers. So let's go to the chat. All right, I see one question in the chat so far. So if anyone else does have any questions, feel free to um, write those in now, but let's go to this one. Um, this is from Corin. If you are operated as a sole proprietor and you are using your potential trademark, would that still be considered in use? Okay, well, if you are, it doesn't matter what you're um, legally organized as. If you're a sole proprietor, an LLC, a corporation, a partnership, whatever that person, the legal person is, if they are using the mark currently, then that is in use. Um, if we're, well, I guess, I guess that's it. So hopefully that answers your question. Omar, anything further to say there? Yeah, it doesn't matter if it's a sole proprietor or what type of legal entity it is. Uh, now, if you're using your potential trademark, would that still be considered in use? If you're using your potential trademark, then it's considered like common law use of the trademark, but it's not use after you're registered. Mm -hmm. Right. Next question. So to qualify your logo for trademark, it must simply be in use. Are there other qualifying factors for a trademark? Yes, it must be used in commerce. Um, and then it must be registered if you want to maximize your trademark protection. Right. And if I can just clarify, so to actually be registered, it needs to be used in commerce. But just to submit an application for a trademark, if you're submitting it a federal application, it doesn't have to be in use yet. That's what could be intent to use. But you won't actually get the registration certificate until it is in use. Um, and then other qualifying factors for a trademark. Um, I mean, I think we, we, it has to be legally uh, used in commerce, can't infringe on anyone else's trademark. So an important thing before you file a trademark application is doing some research. It's called a clearance search, checking um, other things that are registered, um, checking just on Google, going on social media, any place where you might find either an unregistered or a registered mark. That's really the most comprehensive way to do a search. At the very least, search what's been registered. Um, and because if, if what you're proposing would infringe on someone else's mark, it's not going to get registered. 
Next. All right, next question. A distributor that has its own brand has to apply trademark and service mark. So it depends. If a distributor is simply providing transportation services, um, then yes, that's a service. Honestly, I can't really think of anything else um, that they would provide if they happen to have some other goods that they that they sold. Maybe they had a website where you could buy T-shirts with their you know, logo. But again, unless they're really a T-shirt company, that's not a proper use of the trademark. So um, it would really just be, I think, service marks for, um, for distributors unless there is a good that they're providing separately. Yeah, I mean, the way I think about it is if they're not putting their uh, name on the product, you know, identifying themselves as a source of the goods sold, then they don't need a trademark. But if they are like, you know, putting their name on the product as a source of the goods sold, you know, uh, some distribution companies kind of do that, then for sure they would need a trademark. Trademark indicates source of goods sold. Service mark indicates source of services that are offered for sale. Okay, they're packaging flour under their own brand. Okay, yeah. so yeah, if they're providing their own goods that has a brand, because distributors can package um, raw flour. So yeah, in that case, they would want to do both. I mean, and it depends on like on the packages that would be their trademark for their brand. But then as they're, if they're advertising their distribution services, that's when they'd use the SM. And then they would want to be doing that at the state level as well as potentially at the federal level. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Awesome. Any other questions? Well, while we're waiting for some other questions, I'll just I'll make a few quick comments. Um, uh, if any of you is going to be um, at the HCGA event and celebration uh, on Saturday, I'll be there. So come say hello. Also, you can see on this last page, we've recently off opened a New York office. Um, so if, if you or anyone is, is looking for um, legal advice in New York related to their cannabis uh, program, which is about to get up and running, it's really exciting. Um, please reach out to us. Our, uh, my colleague, Andrew, is um, licensed in New York, and he's going to be taking the lead with that office. Um, yes, yeah, so you can see the new contact info for us, for us right there. In addition to, we'll still be working with California, of course. And then we have all a right. Here's another question: How long does it usually take to um, for to go through the state trademark office? Okay, so I'll, I'll, we'll talk about timelines for state and federal trademarks real quick. So the state um, trademark.